This video is to kind of serve as a bit of a background for what I've done thus far. 92 to 95 Honda Civic, the body is a 92. Various bits and pieces, odds and ends are mixed matched. I'm sure we all know how Hondas go. Currently, we've got the doors off, both sides. I'm a fan of four doors because they have a little bit more room, but I also like compacts because they're small. So, you know, best of both worlds, I guess. The end goal is going to be designing and building my own vehicle from the ground up. And to that end, I figure Civic's probably a good, cheap, I'm not going to ruin its value type of type of base for that. What I have done is a few light mods. Right? I have an exhaust manifold that's custom built quite poorly because we didn't end up actually having all the parts to do it and I needed the car back on the road that day. So it never actually got done correctly. It's fine, the engine runs, it's not a big deal. It's not a performance car by any means. This is a fuel economy car. That is its purpose, that is why they were built. Some of the things I've done, I don't know if we'll be able to see it here. Let me get the handy dandy flashy light out. So that motor mount, I don't know if you can tell, is welded. Well, transmission mount, I guess, is welded because it is, it's got rubber in the middle still, but it's all burnt out from the welding process, right? So, I have two of three, I guess two of five, motor mounts that are solid like that. That transmission mount and the rear motor mount, which is down underneath. This one is still the factory rubber, just haven't gotten around to it yet. The two D-links that go up underneath on the front here, one's mounted to the compressor bracket, One's mounted to a transmission bracket down there. They go on the body to keep the engine from, from rocking and vibrating so much. Those are, I think, Hasport polyurethanes. They're, they're aftermarket and they're a bit harder. I don't think they're solids. I think they are uh, vibration damping still. Eventually, the whole engine's very likely going to be mounted to the body with hard mounts and then a vibration damper added to the system. We can see battery relocation, obviously. We've got, uh, put me a positive terminal on the firewall fairly recently because I got tired of it hanging out there in a taped up terminal. I do have the rear disc upgrade. We can see them in here because we've got these nice vented wheels, right? So I've got a rear disc upgrade. Now this is the 0203 Civic SI rear disc and caliper. They mount to the same mounting points as the factory uh, EXSI bracket on the knuckle. But they're just a slightly larger rotor and pad surface area caliper. And make me some tea here. So the problem with the 0203 Civic SI rear disc upgrade is that the calipers to retain the parking brake mechanism with the cable from the factory cables that were in the 94 to 95 Civics, you do have to turn the calipers upside down, which makes bleeding a bit silly. I found the best solution is to gravity bleed them with the calipers upside down in your hand off the uh, off the bracket so that you can get all the air out and then you just put it on and, and pump it up like normal. So the rear brakes, I want to add a second caliper, which means I gotta pull that knuckle off. You can't get just the knuckle. 
Honda never sold it separate. It doesn't have its own part number. Um, you have to buy an entire trailing arm kit online for like $1,200 these people want to get the rear disc uh, set up. I don't know why people sell the whole trailing arm. You don't need the whole trailing arm. You only, only need the caliper, the line, the knuckle, pads, rotors, hardware, etc., etc. right? But you only need that knuckle. And it's four torques, like T50s or T60s. Um, sometimes it can be a little bit rough breaking them loose, but that, that's all you need. That's all I did. I grabbed the knuckle from a junkyard that I found one because the trailing arms are the same. They're the same mounting holes, they're the, they're the same. The only reason you would need the trailing arm is if you plan on going all wheel drive. You do need the rear trailing arm all wheel drive because it has the cutout and a different bearing so that you can mount a CV axle to the wheel. That's the only different one. All of the rear wheel drive or all of the, the front wheel drive only cars had the same exact trailing arm. The only reason Honda sells it with a different part number for the discs and the drums is simply because they don't sell the knuckle separately. So anyway, I want to put a second caliper for the handbrake because Honda's handbrakes are notoriously not very good. This, this one included, even with the larger surface area of the, the SI stuff, it's not very good. So I want to put a hydraulic system on there, but I want it to be separate from the existing system such that if the existing system breaks, the standard foot brake breaks down, some mechanical failure, it happens, I still have a separate braking system that I can use to hopefully safely stop the motion of my vehicle without causing damage or harm to others. That's literally the whole point. I don't know how OEMs today are getting away with these electronic brakes. With You cannot engage them while the vehicle is in motion. You cannot engage them while it's in gear. Um, they will automatically disengage many of them when you put them in gear. Some of them don't, but many of them do. I have seen them. Um, they tend to have a problem with locking up fairly early in their lifespans. I've seen, what is it, the BMWs, right? The BMWs have a constant problem with the parking brakes not releasing. And you have to go in and manually release it, and then it works fine for a while after that. But it's like, why? Just have a whole separate system that you can manually actuate. What, what is so hard about manual actuation? But if you can gravity bleed all the air out, they work just fine. And funnily enough, I've still got the factory rear drum proportioning valve. Even with the rear drum proportioning valve, this passenger front wheel locks up first every time. 100% reliable. Passenger wheel, passenger front wheel locks up first. Then it's driver front actually. The rear wheels don't lock up all that often. You can see. No ABS, right? Don't like ABS, it makes us poorer drivers. You saw the stuff on the transmission tunnel there. This car is a transmission tunnel because they were all wheel drive in Japan. We never got that version, sadly. I would have loved to have had a 92 to 95 Civic all wheel drive, but they, they did not think that they would sell in the US and maybe they wouldn't have at the time. Uh, today all wheel drive is picking up steam in the US, especially in, in s snow states, right? Because it's just better in snow. But I've got that whole thing insulated a couple of different ways. And you can see I've got the, I did the same thing, the refractory there with the bubble wrap on top and the tape to seal the refractory so it doesn't blow in my face. I've still got a little little bits of the corners there to work on. I don't I don't know quite what I'm gonna do with them yet. The tape won't stick to the asphalt that's still in there. Got the dash stripped out of it, the HVAC's gone. I'll show you that in a minute. 
On the passenger floor, considering this is still experiment time, we've still got the factory asphalt. On the driver's floor, we've got this rubber mat underneath which is this tape, some dynamat, a little bit of foam, this ceramic refractory blanket here, which is, don't, uh, don't play with it too much. And we've got a little bit of a brace back here. The rear deck has been removed. You can see the factory headliner is back in. You can see that there's some foil in there. That is actually, so I used the refractory blanket, sealed it with some tape, some of this uh, actual duct tape, right? Aluminum, aluminum tape. I then put over top of that this duct insulation, which is bubble wrap with foil on either side. Easy peasy. I could have gone out and I could have bought enough of this material, which is some aluminum sheet backed by some fiberglass with an adhesive on it. And I could have put that all over the inside, all over the roof, etc., etc. But that stuff's expensive, so I did not do that. I sort of made my own, but I also made it with more insulation. So I am, I think, improved upon the whole, the whole schmagoigle. And funnily enough, the factory headliner goes right back in no problem. There's a little bit of pressure on the top of it. You can see it kind of bowing out there. A little bit of bowing out there, but some of that was already there in the first place. And you can see the headliners not in the greatest of shapes. Eventually, I'd like to replace it with a solid sheet of aluminum. Something thin enough to form mostly by hand, maybe some light tools, but thick enough that just driving around it won't just twist and warp on its own. See, I've got the, all the carpets and all the, the, the various odds and ends and plastic bits removed. Let's go outside where it's way too bright. Take a look at the trunk. So inside the trunk here, you can see I've cut a little hole in the floor. And there goes my battery. We've got to fix this, this brace here. I need to, to put it back down there in the corner. You can see the battery box from the outside here. Just kind of hangs down. Not a super great job on the patch panel, but it's sealed and it's welded all the way around as opposed to what OEMs usually do with uh, spot welding, right? Discovered this. Not sure exactly what that is. It, so if you look back here, you can see this is clearly not factory. And I showed you the little brace there. You can see this is clearly not factory. Underneath this rubber mat used to be a spare tire bin. And if we go back here, you'll be able to see there is no longer a spare tire bin. You see the battery box over there on the right. The spare tire bin has been removed because A, it was way too small to fit a full size spare. To fit a full-size spare, I'd have to drag it closer to the ground. I wasn't, not necessarily, I wasn't comfortable with that, but I'd also have to make it larger in diameter because the donut was a fair amount smaller than these. And then the factory donut obviously was meant for 13 inch wheels with 185, 75, 13 tires, which would then be a problem also because driving on three of these with one of those would be quite unsafe in the first place. So I just decided to get rid of the spare tire bin altogether. <clears throat> I put a flat plate in, put some square tube around the edge just to give me some material to weld to because I don't have a bead roller. I don't, there's, there's not that much in this garage as it stands now. 
mostly it's storage for parts. If anybody that is interested in civics is interested in stuff you can do while keeping things factory without doing a whole lot of modifications, you can get some really nice wheels. I'm, I've never been a big fan of the multi-drilled rotors. I want the holes for my, my studs and lug nuts and nothing more. I don't like multi-drill holes. So I've got these, you can see they've got the, uh, the not the SI, what is that, the Type R red hubcaps in them, center caps. And these, in case you couldn't tell, are, what year, 2017, 2015, MX-5 wheels, so the Mazda Miata. Now the center hub, is a different bore from the factory Honda hub bore. So you will have to get those machined out, obviously. And the Miata center caps are smaller than the Type R center caps. I believe they were 54 mil. You can look it up, it's, it's not that far different. So you can take to the machine shop, have them bore these things out, and they'll fit on perfectly. Especially if they give you a little bit of a bevel on the inside, like you typically see on OEM wheels, and a lot of higher end wheels. Some of the cheaper wheels, they don't end up having that lip on the end, so taking them on and off can be troublesome, especially if you get you live somewhere where there's rust, where there's salt, and you start getting that uh, material expansion and a little bit of galvanic corrosion there from the dissimilar materials. I haven't even refinished the bore areas, they're, they're still just plain aluminum. They're, there's no, they're not powder coated. They're not, there's no kind of coating on them whatsoever other than the aluminum oxide that naturally forms anyway, which prevents further oxidation, assuming you don't disturb it in any way. And probably this is fine. These are the same offset. 17s as opposed to the factory 13s that came on this car at one point i had the 15 civic si wheels from this era on there and they did fine but 15 inch tires in a style that i like are getting a little bit harder to find as time goes on because every everybody's moving oems are all moving to bigger wheels right so everything's moving that way so me I'm particular about my tread design. I like my moderately aggressive directional tires. All right? So that's what I tend to go for. They help with grip. Not always in the wet. These do, you can see, these do have the rain channels in them. I prefer a Toyo, what is that, T1R? They don't make them in this size. I'd have to go up a size that ends up interfering with the front fender and inner wheel wells. You can see them there. These are the wide bands. They run back into the dash. One of them runs to the ECU, but it's not currently being utilized in the map um, because the signal is the signal conditioning in the ECU is not very good. It's, it's older ECU, obviously. Um, I have done, so it's a D15 B7 engine. Uh, block head, pistons, cam is, is all that stuff. I do have a Z6 intake manifold, which has the slightly larger runners, and I believe the slightly larger bore plenum I have deleted the fast idle valve which goes along with the throttle body actually this throttle body is off of a prelude I think the f22 so it's a 54 millimeter 56 millimeter throttle body which matches the plenum more closely. There's still a little bit of discontinuity there. Not worried about it for right now. It's not a big deal. It runs and drives. It's got about 100 horses, etc., etc. You can see I've got me a solid tube instead of the corrugated OEM tube. 
but I'm still using the factory air box for the factory filter. They're cheap, they, they work, they're effective, they're simple to replace. I did have cold air, like the Scotia type of filters on there for a number of years. And they were just, they're, they're, they're a lot of work to maintain. Because especially when you're living in a high dust environment, you drive down dusty roads all the time. It is so much easier to replace a $20 filter, $15 filter, $12 filter, wherever you get it, than it is to remove, clean, and you have to wait a couple hours for the thing to dry fully before you can oil it and put it back on the car. Um, and honestly, the surface area is equivalent. It's not, you're not getting that much different. The reason I added the factory air box back in is because A, it just mounts right in, obviously, because that's the way they designed it. But down there is the headlight uh, wiring. And I noticed that without a proper bracket of some kind, which at the time I didn't have the, the ability or the wherewithal to design or build, without a bracket of some kind, the filter just rests there and can and will interfere with your wires. I, I had to replace some wires at one point and that's about the time when I got tired of it and went out and got the factory air box, it's fine. I have added a small vacuum reservoir. That style comes off of a, an S10. I use it because it's a smaller one and it just kind of fits in the engine bay of these cars just wherever you want to stick it really. I have put equal length wires on for the sake of spark efficiency. The more efficient your engine runs, the more effectively you can use smaller amounts of fuel, etc., etc. With the 240cc injector, the maximum duty cycle I have ever seen is 34%. Which as you can imagine means that tuning the idle is a quarter of the way to impossible. I've got it in. There's still some hiccups on very cold or very hot days, but I don't think I'm gonna get out of that unless I can find 140 cc injectors for these things that came factory with them that are good, that they're new. So, those are some of the things I've done I've also done almost completely the LED conversion. I uh, apparently never did the turn signals in the back for whatever reason as LED. There's still bulbs in there. Um, that, that'll be an up and coming. That's $40, $50. Order the parts, stick them in. Um, I've got an idea to retrofit these single bulb halogens to a um, mini projector with uh, you know the, the solenoid style, the servo style, so you have high beam, low beam, and a single projector. You can see my quite poor V1. You can see where I was trying to fix that corner quite not well. So the V1 of this cowl, whose purpose, obviously, is to remove underhood heat and it does so quite effectively. A secondary purpose is actually airflow characteristics over the hood and the front end. So in the the transition from the hood to the windshield you get that that sharp angle there as the windshield comes up off of the plane that was the hood and what you end up getting is a low pressure area and then a high pressure area at that transition where the air has to change direction again so what i'm going what, what i've done is this isn't quite wide enough you can see there's still lip there it was an experiment to see if it would do what i wanted to do there is a plan to do stuff to the rear i'm going to put a small lip spoiler here 
to, it's a diffuser. I'm gonna put a diffuser at the back here to, to, to change this transition a bit. I'm gonna do the same on the trunk lid. So it's gonna be, I don't know how big it needs to be. I'm thinking it's gonna to have to be a wing to bring the air straight off this surface. And I'm gonna measure this angle as it comes down, right? And where it transitions from the roof to the glass, I'm going to have a wing, probably on the trunk lid, to provide a straighter path, right? There'll be, the whole idea is to make all the transit, the air transitions as absolutely smooth as they can be. If you look around online, you'll find a guy that has one of these cars, it's a four-door Honda Civic in white, even, I'm pretty sure he has tan interior too, that he built a whole fiberglass shell to shape it similar to the, what the heck was that thing called, CHR? It was that, that first hybrid, that early hybrid that Honda made that was just similar to the Prius, but worse in shape. So he did that and he got a good 15, 20% economy out of it. I don't need to go necessarily that drastic. I would like to increase the economy while keeping the weight down and maintaining sort of just the look of a normal car. Granted, the wing is gonna look silly. It's gonna be probably very large and, and quite absurd, especially the, that this is a fuel economy car. Um, but I'm also going to put, at some point, a diffuser underneath, like you get on, on modern sports cars, race cars, track cars, etc., to help smooth that transition of air because that creates a lot of turbulence, which also creates a lot of drag. Right, so there's a lot of things that need to be done and many of them are time, but some of it is money, right? So another up, up and coming project, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna say what I'm gonna do the engine yet because I haven't finalized the idea. I don't wanna talk about it until I've got the idea kind of sorted but I'm gonna do a thing to the engine. So, <laughs> the AC, I've got me here, an AC compressor from the 90, early 90s, so OBD-1 Accords. Um, they use the same compressor design in the 01, 02, I think, 03, 04 Accords, and CRVs, no, Odysseys, I think the Odysseys. Um, the mounting holes are different. This is the bracket off of a D16Y7, which has the same block casting externally, I believe, as the D15B7. Um, so these, these four holes for the compressor, they don't quite line up. They appear to be about 12 millimeters or so off center. Um, so you can't just slap that on there. Also, the pulley, you can see, sticks out quite a bit from the body. It does interfere with the, the D bracket link. Uh, the, the, the arm here so that's that's something I have to think about and come over and look at the Civic and you look down in this hole I don't know if we can see it this way so we can see there, there's a tiny bit of room down there actually that we can move stuff around this shroud is fairly large so I'm going to be getting a, a thinner fan and building a custom shroud so that'll open up some room there. But I'm gonna put the, heart, the higher capacity compressor on the Civic, which I'm sure we're all HVAC experts and we know that a higher capacity compressor will allow me a higher capacity overall system, given that I can A, remove the heat fast enough through the same condenser, which is the point of the cowl, and I can, I can move enough heat, super heat, through the evaporator to make the whole system function also. So it's all of the stuff that I'm doing has to work together for it to be truly effective, right? So hopefully in the next, I'm thinking six months. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping six months I can I can get the compressor mounted. I can get 
a prototype V1 HVAC box, blower, heater core, evaporator, blend door, manifold system installed on a plate inside the cabin and then have it all testable, ready to drive down the road next summer. Like the, the idea is hopefully by the middle or end of winter, I will have the AC and heater ready that I can try to experiment and see if it, if it works and what I might need to do to, to update it. Uh, one consideration that we're doing, so we're, I, I've come up with the idea of a modular, so you see how we've got this clamshell half here, right? So there's two halves. Well, this half sits one on the bottom and one on the top. I don't like that. What I want is I want a clamshell against the firewall. So I'm going to make that plate and we're going to put a clamshell against that plate against the firewall here and the clamshell is going to be the back half clamshell. I'm then going to have one front half clamshell for the evaporator, one front half clamshell for the uh, heater core, and then I'm going to have a separate probably four piece um, glue it together because this is all going to be 3D printed also. I don't know if I mentioned that or not. I don't think I did. Um, but then also, also, on top of all of the clamshells that were changing the orientation from this to this to make it easier to, to deal with if you ever have to work on anything, I'm also going to put access panels for each of them. So you don't have to remove the entire clamshell piece to remove the core. You just remove the access panel you remove the connections on the, on the firewall and you slide the whole thing out, like adapter and all. That is the plan. Whether it's going to come to fruition or not, I don't know. This all comes down to what we can come up with. I've got the ideas, I've got some basic shapes in my head, and then my buddy that does the CAD has to be able to make it work in the real world. Um, so we'll find out. But that is, that is the plan. Uh, we could probably also talk about the electric steering. So I'm getting rid of the the, the, the hydraulic steering, right? And I'm going to electric steering. So I have a large 300 or 320 watt off-road steering motor here. You can see, he's kind of a he's a he's a big boy. The Honda OEM ones that they have like on the racks are not even close to that big for this size of car. So it's it's I've definitely gone overkill with that and it is gonna go right up there underneath so all that you can see that bracket on the firewall there if it'll focus thank you so, so the bracket on the firewall there since I can't stick my hand in front of it is getting removed the pipes getting removed the cluster is we'll figure that out when we get to it burn that bridge when we find it right and you can see the shaft down there right so that shaft is getting modified somewhere about right there where those gauges are hanging down. And we're going to put the motor in there. I'm thinking I'm going to have to do a gear and chain system to make it work just the way I want it to. So it doesn't interfere with the pedals and it doesn't interfere with your knees when you're just sitting in the, in the vehicle. Um, but that's going to be hooked up. And once that's hooked up, we are going to get rid of the hydraulic power steering pump that's bolted to the engine there. And that is going to be, I don't know yet, I'm thinking a second alternator to eventually put uh, a stereo back in the thing. But that is a way, way future project. Um, what's going to happen without that power steering pump is I'm gonna have more room to do stuff. So this will go away, this will go away, this will go away, right? And then, since I've got this area over here where the battery used to be, I've got my hands on some hydro boosters, if it'll focus. So, 
I'm putting Hydro Boost on my little bitty Civic. That's going to be powered by... It's buried, I'm not going to dig it out. But that's going to be powered by the MR2 electro-hydraulic power steering pump. And it's going to be... I'm thinking about putting a pressure sensor on it, so when the pressure drops below a specific trigger value, the pump will turn on. So it's not just always running while you're driving down the road, because that's, that's, I don't know, 70 amps worth of motor constantly running. You don't want that. Um, I might do a high power and a low power state. I might just do an on and off state. I don't know. Um, but Hydro Boost, they do the same thing. They have an accumulator, right? So they do the same thing as a vacuum booster where they store one or two pumps worth of pedal travel at full pressure to provide. It's, it's something like 80% pressure on the first pump, 45 or 50% pressure on the second pump, and then it's just, you, you can't tell the difference really below that once you lose the thing running the brake system. Um, but it's still mechanical hookup through, so you still have, you, you still have mechanical brakes. And there you have a little bit of background and some of my plans for the future. Stay tuned for another video where I sit down with the whiteboard and I go through a list of all the things that I've actually done. Not all of them are things that you can see. This video was just some things that you could see from the outside and some things that you would see on the inside. So if you want a more comprehensive list, go take a look at the other video and let me know what you think in the comments below.